Welcome to our midweek Bible study here at Red Mountain Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us and tuning in, getting online to watch this. It's good to be back with you recording a midweek Bible study. I missed doing this the past couple weeks. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we had missions night and then last week uh, I was at the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, Tennessee, but it's good to be back and just uh, sharing God's Word with you. Uh, we're working our way through some highlights of the book of Ephesians and we're in Ephesians chapter 2 tonight. If you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn there. And as we begin our time together, I just want to remind you and encourage you to continue praying for revival in the Church of America. And we need God to do a mighty work in our midst to raise up His people to, to be out there sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, be living for the Lord. And I pray that you're doing that this week and asking God to bring revival on a daily basis and therefore bring a spiritual awakening to this nation that we'll see a great harvest of souls and people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and lives will be changed for all eternity. And this, uh, God will just use us and give us a passion, burn in our hearts a passion to be reaching the lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we're actually talking about that tonight, talking about the greatest story of all. But as we begin, let's just pray for that uh, revival to come, pray for that spiritual awakening to take place in this nation. Father, we thank you for what you have done in our lives that are Christian, Lord, and we thank you for our salvation. And Father, we just pray that you raise up your church and bring revival to your people, Father to be a beacon of hope, to be a beacon of light in this very dark, sin-filled world. So many people are lost, Father. So many people need salvation, Father. And Father, forgive us for not being passionate about sharing the gospel. May you burn our hearts a desire, a passion to reach the lost people in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our places of work, in our community, to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Father. Father, we just pray that you just draw us closer to you, make us more Christ-like each and every day, and do a mighty work in our life to bring glory and honor to you and to reach this world with the gospel, Father. And therefore, we pray for a great spiritual awakening in this nation. We'll see a great harvest of souls, Father. So many people are lost. So many people, if they would die right now, would go spend an eternity in hell because they don't know Jesus, the Lord and Savior. And Father, we just pray that you just will draw them to you seeking salvation. Use us to take the gospel to them, Father, so they can experience life as we're talking about that very thing tonight, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for a great spiritual awakening in this nation like we've never seen before. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, we've been journeying on Wednesday evenings through our uh, the book of Ephesians and looking at some highlights out of the book of Ephesians. And tonight we're looking at the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. You know, one of the most famous set of verses in the Bible is found here in Ephesians chapter 2, and it's verses 8 and 9. And if you look, you see what it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. I don't know about you, but I remember I memorized those two verses many years ago when I was a young teenager as we were getting ready for a mission trip and we had to learn to, to share our faith. And, and uh, a lot of new Christians memorize those two verses because it tells us about our salvation. It tells us that it's, it's by God's grace. It's, it's by putting faith in Him. It's not by anything we can do, but simply what God has done for us. But, but really what comes before those two verses and what comes after those two verses is not as well known as those two verses. And yet we truly can appreciate the great news of the gospel, we can't really understand the, the, the whole narrative of the Bible even, or can't even understand who, re, who we really are and, and who we can be and who we need to become until we understand the full story. And that's those verses that are around, verses 8 and 9. You see, these verses contain it all. We see our past, we see our present, we see our future. Because our story is about our past guilt because of sin. Our story is about the present grace we have in our life because of God's love for us and, and also that, that future glory we'll experience one day. So today what we're looking at is we're looking at the greatest story of all. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about God's love for us, what he's done for us, where we came from and where we can be if we're not already there through Jesus Christ. You see, if you get these things down in your heart and you get these things down in your mind, if you, in your mind you begin to understand them, you begin to believe them and you live them out. God's plan is going to come to pass in your life. There's three things I want us to see tonight as we think about the greatest story of all. The first is this. We all start out hopeless. We all start out hopeless. We all start out with the same condition. Let me just kind of warn you here. Paul is not one who's really politically correct. Uh, he, he sometimes, his bedside manner is just not all that great. 
because he gets right to the heart of the matter here. He doesn't mince any words. He doesn't pull any punches. He's just describing how all of us are born in this world, what every single one of us is really like until we are born again. So in other words, he's describing everyone who's without Jesus Christ to begin with. His first statement here is, is devastating. And it's very direct. Look what he says in verse 1. And you, he made a lie. But look, who were dead in trespasses and sins. He clearly says that we all come into this world spiritually dead. Every person comes to this world born spiritually DOA, dead on arrival. We are all born alive physically, but we are born dead spiritually. We are, we are not just spiritually deficient. We're not just spiritually uh, disabled. No, we are spiritually dead. We are more than just our physical bodies. We, we, we have a soul. We have spirits. And we may be physically alive on the outside, but inwardly we are dead. Do you remember in the Garden of Eden, going back to Genesis, what God said to Adam? He said, in the day that you eat of that fruit, that fruit that God said, don't touch, don't eat, what he said was going to happen, you will surely die. Well, what happened? Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Now, they didn't die physically, but they dropped dead spiritually, if you want to think about it that way. Because the moment that Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, something inside them died. It was their spirit. It was, it was their soul. Everything went went dead. Everything went dark in our life, if you would, spiritually. Think about it that way. The day, that day until now, that's how every single person comes in this world, spiritually dead. Every person who is born becomes a part of the walking dead spiritually, if you will. You, you know, zombies is a big thing right now. If you want to think about it, spiritual zombies until Jesus' life, Jesus comes into our life and he gives us everlasting life. Until that time, our, our life is dead. We're, we're, our soul is dark. But, you know, but Jesus can come and give us life. Jesus can come and give us light to the darkness of our soul. And that's why, apart from the power of God, people can look at the Bible, but they can't see the truth. You need God to direct you in truth. People can listen to the gospel, but they can't hear the truth of the gospel until God begins to draw them, until God begins to, to work in their lives. People without God are just hopelessly lost. They are, they're like a blind man who's in a dark room that's looking for a black cat that's not even there. You see the hopelessness there. See, once we understand that you, that this is, we know what we see is going on. This is how we're born. Look at how Paul continues in verse two, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Everyone in this world follows God in God's ways, or they follow Satan in his ways. Everybody either serves God, or they serve some other false god. God is the God of the living. Satan is the God of the dead. God leads us to obey him. Satan leads us to disobey God. If there's one group of people in the world that should understand that, if you think about it, it's parents. There's never been a parent who had to teach their child to disobey. I, I've, been, I, I've been counseling for years, and I've never had a parent come to my office and say, Dave, you know, I've got a problem. All my child wants to do is obey me. They never disobey me. That's never happened, and it never will happen. You don't have to teach a child to, to steal. You don't have to teach a child to, to cheat or to, or to fight with their sibling or to lie. They learn all that on their own because that's the way they're born. They're born with a spirit of disobedience because they're born spiritually dead. They have that sinful nature inside them. But the news continues. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we all once con conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now, to clarify who he's talking about here, Paul just makes it pretty plain. He's talking about all of us. There's no exception. He's including the Jews and the Gentiles. He's not just talking about murderers. He's not just talking about those terrorists out there. He's not just talking about child abusers or rapists. He's talking about people who obey the law. He's talking about people who disobey the law. He's talking about people who are capitalists. He's talking about people who are socialists. He's talking about liberals. He's talking about conservatives. He's talking about whether you're a Democrat or Republican or Independent. He's talking about people if you're, if you're gay or you're straight. He's talking about people who are born rich or born in poverty. You get the picture? He's talking about everybody. The best of us and the worst of us. He's included everybody in this. And this is why, before we can ever understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us, we must first understand who we are and what we have done. Paul was talking to both those who believe in Christ and those who don't. One thing is true of you right now. Either you are spiritually dead or you were spiritually dead. These verses either are talking about your past or are talking about your present. Because we're all born the same way, and we all stay that way spiritually dead until we trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now that's the next thing I want you to see. 
You see, we're born this way and we're hopeless, but the second thing I want you to see is this. Notice God's love is extraordinary. Yes, we are born dead. We are all born that, in that hopeless state, but God's love is extraordinary. Now, there's two conditions of the human spirit. Uh, excuse me, two conditions of the human spirit that are just killers. I mean, think about it. They're, they're just crushing. They're devastating uh, to people's lives. When, when someone feels absolutely helpless, that's devastating, isn't it? I mean, think about it. If you're like a parent who whose child is in a, in the operating room and, and they're having this life uh, altering, this life changing surgery that can mean life or death for them, and all you can do is wait in that weight room. You feel totally. Helpless. That's just a devastating place to be in, isn't it? But even worse than that is to feel totally hopeless, to be convinced there's no light at the end of the tunnel, to be convinced that that you know that this problem you're facing is unsolvable, or, there, or there's no answer to to the questions you have. And what Paul has just described is is the human race apart from God, that we are hopeless and that we are helpless apart from God, that we need God. And Paul, you know, put, puts this before us. So this is the state we're born in. This is the state we are. But then he says two words that are totally changing. These, these words, they guarantee help for the helpless. They guarantee hope for the hopeless. Look what he says in verse 4. But God. Those two words change everything. But God. Let's talk about those two, two words just for a moment. Take that word but. Have you ever thought about how that little three-letter word can really change your life? Let's say the phone rings at your house and your child's on the other end of the phone. And they say something like this. Mom, Dad, I've been in a car accident. And, and, and you, your throat, I mean, your heart kind of jumps in your throat. And, and then all of a sudden they say this, but I'm okay. Changes everything, doesn't it? Or let's say you're sitting in a doctor's office and the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you, but you have cancer. And it kind of takes your breath away. But then they say this, but it's completely cur curable and we've caught it in time. Now you take that word, but you put it next to God. Man, that makes a big difference. Not just a big difference, that makes all the difference in the world when you think about it. They make an eternal difference. You see, he doesn't say, but you, because there's nothing you can do. There's not anything you can do. He, he, you're dead, if you think about it. I can't do anything for you. You're dead. You can't do anything for me. I'm dead. We're dead together. But God, the God who spoke the world into existence, the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, can give us spiritual life. You see, a dead man needs life. That's what a dead man needs. What did God do? Verse 5 contains the words that we should all be thrilled to hear. Look, it says, even when you were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Those words made us alive are only used twice in the, in the New Testament. That phrase is really, it's a compound word that literally means to make life. We were dead before God came into our lives, but God makes life out of death. Just as God breathes breathe life into, into dust and he made the first human being physically, he made Adam. God brings life into our heart and makes us spiritually alive. Why did God do that for us? Well, it gets even better. Let's put these verses together. Look at verses four and five together. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. There are three great words in these verses that, that make an eternal difference in our lives. The words love, mercy, and grace. You see, we all start out hopeless, but God's love is extraordinary. Remember, God loved us when we were dead. When we were disobedient, God loved us. You know, people say love is blind. Friend, God's love is not blind. God sees it all. We, with all my faults, with all my failures, and all my, 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 falls, my, my flaws in life, God still loved me, and God still has sent his son to die for me. God loved us when we were unloving. God loved us when we were unlovable. God doesn't love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because God loves us. It says God is rich in mercy, which means he didn't give us what we deserved. I'm so glad that the well of God's mercy never runs dry. We don't get what we deserve. And then he says, by grace, you've been saved. You see, it all starts with grace and it all ends with grace. Because of God's mercy, he doesn't give us what we deserve, but because of his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us everlasting life. Because of his love, he gives us mercy and grace. You see how extraordinary God's love is for us? And that leads us to the third thing I want you to see. Jesus gives life. Jesus gives life. You see, it all begins with Jesus. It all ends with Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. You see, only the Lord can give spiritual life, and Jesus Christ is Lord. Because Jesus Christ is Lord, that means that, that He is Lord over everything. He is Lord over everyone. That means He is Lord over life and death. And He is Lord over, he, he is Lord over all. 
He's the only one who can give life to death. Why? Because he's the only one who rose from the dead. Look at verse 5 again. When, even when you were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with who? With Christ. Jesus lives physically so I can live spiritually through him. Because Jesus lives physically, I can live personally for him. Because Jesus lives physically, I get to live eternally with him. But it's only with Jesus. The only thing a dead person needs is life. I mean, think about it. A dead person doesn't need money. A dead person can't spend money. A dead person doesn't need food. They can't eat. A dead person doesn't need water. They can't drink. They don't even need air. They can't breathe. A dead person doesn't need light. They can't see. A dead person doesn't need sound. They can't hear. What does a dead person need? A dead person needs life. Remember, we were dead. We were dead in our trespasses. That's how we're born. Though we were dead in trespasses and sin, we can be made alive because Jesus is alive. Because he lives, so can you and I. Christianity is not about sick people getting better. It's about dead people coming to life. But God, in this life, is not just the end of it. God has, has not done all this just so we could go spend a term with him in heaven and be at peace, which we get to do, which is huge. But look at what verse 10 says. For, you, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saves us, yes, to spend eternity with him, but also to serve him. Our salvation is primarily for God's glory, not just for our good. True salvation doesn't just lead us to heaven, and that's it. It's more than just that. It's more than just that happiness and that joy. It's also about holiness as well. One day we're going to be happy and joyful in heaven, yes. And the best part is we'll be holy as he is holy. But right now on this earth, right now where we are today, we are to live out that holiness. And we do it by, by living for him. We do it by, by doing good for other people, by serving the needs of others, by doing good works for God. Mount Whitney out in California is the highest spot in the continental United States. It stands at 14,495 feet. If you hike to the top of that mountain, you'll be surrounded by crystal air and cool breezes. You'll see beautiful lakes. And if you look 80 miles southeast, you'll see Death Valley, the lowest spot in the continental United States. It's 280 feet below sea level. It's also one of the hottest places in the country. It can reach 134 degrees in the shade. Well, think about this. What we just read is meant to be the spiritual biography of all of us. That's supposed to be our story. Because of Jesus, we can go from the, from the valley of death, the valley of spiritual death, to the mountaintop of eternal life. In the meantime, as we travel up that, to that mountaintop, we're going to be taking other people with us. We're going to be serving those around us. We're going to be reaching and loving and caring for those around us and those all around us. That we're going to be serving them and bringing them with us to Jesus. heard about some fishermen one time. They'd come in from fishing and, and they're relaxing in a dining room at a Scottish inn there by the sea and they're ferry, sharing their fish stories. You know how fishermen can be. The, the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, one guy was sharing his story, and he got really passionate about the fish that got away. And he threw his arms out to show how big it was, and the waitress was walking by, and he hit her tray, and it had a tea kettle on there, and that tea kettle flew against the white wall. And that tea splashed against that white wall, and it stained that white wall, just this ugly stain of brown. Well, the innkeeper came out, he looked at that wall, and he said, well, I guess that whole wall is going to be painted now. Well, just a couple tables over, there was a stranger sitting there, and he said, oh, Sir, maybe not. Do you mind if I work with that wall a little bit and see what I can do? And the innkeeper owner, he said, Well, you know, he, sure, you go, you go right ahead. What's, what's, I have nothing to lose. So that man had a little suitcase with him. He opened it up. He put out some pencils and brushes and jars of paint and jars of, of pigment, and, and he began to sketch lines around that stain, and he began to apply shades of color here and shades of color there all around the splashes of that tea. And in time, this image began to emerge. When he was finished, there was this picture of a beautiful deer with this huge rack of antlers. And that man signed his name at the bottom of that wall, and he paid for his meal, and he left. His name was Sir Edwin Landseer. He was a very famous painter of wildlife. In his hands, that tragic, terrible mistake had become a tremendous masterpiece. Think about this. We were all born covered with the stain of sin. We came in this world spiritually dead, but because of Jesus, God can take even the worst of us and make a masterpiece out of us. And he will place us one day in his trophy case in heaven, if you will. My friend, that's the greatest story of all. But let me ask you, have you experienced that in your life? Have you come to that, that time in your life where you realize you're a sinner? You say, what, what a, some people today don't even know what a sinner is. They don't even know what sin is. 
See, sin goes all the way back to, to the beginning of this world. See, God created this, this universe in, in six days, and, and after creation, He said this place was, was good. It was perfect. But then Adam and Eve made a choice, and they sinned against God. They disobeyed Him. I talked about it earlier. And sin entered the world, and that sin nature was passed out to all of us. Therefore, we're sinners. We disobey God. And the Bible says because of our sins, we can't get to heaven. We can't have a relationship with God. And one day, we have to pay for our sins. And that punishment is eternal hell, which is eternal torment separated from God. But God didn't create hell for us. He created hell for Satan and his demons. And God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to pay the punishment for our sins. And Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day. If you ask him to forgive you, he'll forgive you your sins. You ask him to come into your life to be your Savior, to be your Lord, that you're, that you're going to choose to live your life for him, he will. That you put your, your life in his hands, that you trust him to save you, he will. Why not do that today? Maybe you've done that. Praise God you've done that. But let me ask this. Are you keeping that to yourself or are you sharing it with the world around us? Every day, people are dying to go to hell. I, I shared a statistic the other Sunday in one of my messages that it's the North American Mission Board has told us that 96.7% of Southern Baptists have never, ever shared a verbal witness with someone who's lost. 96.7. Friend, we've got a lot of work to do. It's time for us to ask God to make us bold and to go and reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ and stop keeping the greatest story of all to ourself. Father, thank you for our salvation. Thank you for your perfect plan. Thank you for loving us so extraordinary that in our sinfulness, in our state of being spiritually dead, you loved us anyways. And you made it possible for us to have salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for the life you give us. And I pray for anybody who's watching this who doesn't, who hasn't experienced that gift of salvation, that they today will ask forgiveness of their sins. And they will put their trust and faith in you, Jesus, to be their Savior and to be their Lord. And they'll receive that gift of everlasting life. Father, I pray for us Christians we've done that. And I pray that we will not keep that to ourselves. That we will be out there sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. The greatest story of all with this world around us. Use us this week to reach people with the gospel, with the love of God. We ask this here in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching, and uh, I'm just so thankful for you to tune in. And if we can ever do anything for you, serve, serve you anyway, pray for you. If you want to talk about salvation, at the end of this video, you'll see our phone number, you'll see our website. Please contact us. We'd love to connect with you and talk with you about Jesus Christ and our great God.